Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel O'Connor. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga's Pre Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Elkan, and Dennis Dick with you. Busy Monday morning, so I thought we'd be talking about the Mexico tariff headlines over the weekend. Then we will. We have a lot of individual uh, news to discuss as well, especially in MA land. So we had the Raytheon UTX deal over the weekend. This morning, we're getting a big acquisition from Salesforce, potential acquisition in, in Shutterfly, uh, Tilray's in the news, AMD's in the news. So a lot to discuss on our show. And then our guest, a great one, Whitney Tilson, uh, Empire Financial Research famed hedge fund manager. He would join the show at 8 to 35, talk about why he is bullish. Uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and LL, and why he is bearish. Tesla, that, that'll be in about 35 minutes or so. Joel, what's happening here overnight? Uh, good follow through on Friday's rally. A few different factors for that. Pre market high that was made right off the opening bell when we went to 28.98. That's a good target on the upside because. May 8's high is right in that area as well. On the downside, pre-market low, 80.50. So really, you filled the gap from yesterday by six points. Now just kind of hanging out mid-range. Crude, slowly recovering here, up 26 cents at 54 and a quarter. Gold giving it back down 1580 at 133030. Silver, it's sniff 15, but down 32 cents at 1471. And Quiet weekend for Bitcoin here. Uh, I have it just trading basically unchanged here, just hovering at 8,000. So let's say bring in Triple D. Triple D and I were working over the weekend uh, with Jeremy, and we made a birthday video for Yvonne. And Yvonne, I hope you enjoyed that video. We had fun doing it. Happy birthday. And I know uh, your daughter Robin's hanging out in the YouTube chat, so we wanted to give you another shout out on that. And uh, Triple D, your head on a swivel there. Oh, with the head on a swivel. Happy birthday, Yvonne. Seven years old over the weekend. One of our great listeners there. We appreciate everybody who's listening to Pre-Market Prep every morning. I will tell you, this has been one of the busiest mornings that I've seen in a long time. And it, it started for me just after four in the morning when my daughter, two-year-old daughter, decided that she was going to be awake for the day. Uh, me and my wife fought in bed for a little bit. We tried to get her to sleep uh, just between us, and she would have none of it. I finally just threw in the towel. and We basically just weighed out each other. Sometimes my wife gets up, sometimes I get up. But I finally just threw in the towel, and I got up with her at 5 a.m. So I'm laying on the couch until about 6.30 when I got to obviously wake up my wife and go to work. So sit at my desk. I, I was a little bit late today getting to the desk, so logging in. I had an Internet issue, so I had to, like, reset my modem. And get all that figured out. Finally get logged in at about 6.55. Trying to buy stuff, obviously, you know, and get some orders out there because we've got movement here in the S&Ps. We know the Mexico deal. I already was well aware of the UTX RTN deal. So just getting my wits about me and 7 o'clock rolls around and boom, 7 a.m. news, data to be acquired by CRM. I'm like, holy cow, trying to get my like wits about me. And I'm like, okay. That's huge, obviously. So I know I'm not going to get a piece of data. That's going up instantly there. But I'm running, you know, cloud. Okay, thinking cloud right away. What can I buy? I was able to get some Twilio. Uh, I think 145 and a quarter is what I ended up getting. I just missed the 145. Bought some 145 and a quarter. Go to the Splunkster. Nothing to be had. Go to now. Nothing to be had. So I'm like, okay. So riding the Twilio. I'm like, don't worry about that. Um, then I'm like all my other overnight positions as well. So I go to CRM, then look at that. I was like, I should short CRM. I'm like, oh, no, it's down three bucks. I'm not going to short it down three bucks. And then I move on. I'm looking for more cloud stocks. Then I look at my overnight portfolio. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm long CRM. <laughs> That's a horrible thing. So you know you have a lot of positions when you don't even notice that you're long CRM. And at this point, it's down six bucks. So I'm like, okay, nothing I can do. Got to eat that. Sell it down $6. So I'm out of CRM. But my Twilio position was a lot bigger than CRM. So... I was able to actually make the money back more than that on the Twilio long, which I'm now out of. So it was a busy, safe to say, it was a busy first hour 
for trading uh, after uh, being very tired. So I'm very tired, a little bit cranky, but I'm alive. All that's right. my that's my story. How was your weekend? Uh, it was good. <laughs> it was good. Not clearly. I didn't have quite the Sunday morning that you did, but uh, just the usual, you know, a couple swims, hanging out, doing things around the house. And not like I said, nothing, uh, nothing like you. But uh, last night, you know, nice, uh, nice move in the S&Ps, able to take a, l- a little bit of advantage of that. And now we're just back up, just trading mid range. So but the other thing that uh, I just want to make announce that tickets are going fast. OK, we are up to 90 traders in the traders lounge. Right just now. in the trading lounge, just in the trading lounge here. How many is in the main room? Uh, so, several hundred. That's not that's an that's not an issue because it's you know the, the it's the tra- a big room. Yeah, the trading lounge is a smaller room and we're limiting capacity. So uh, we're at ninety, and I think the capacity is probably somewhere close to a hundred, uh, if not at ninety. That's for real. We're not even like that's not a joke. So no, no yeah, that, that's we meant only to have be- so much room in that trading room. They're more expensive tickets. But that's where you're going to get all access to me and Joel all day, plus Jeremy Newsome and Amory Band. And- um, everybody else who's lined, Christian Frommer, it's everybody else who's lined up in there. So um, the main room, we still have lots of room in the main room, correct? Like there's, there's going to be enough tickets in the main yeah, room. Yeah, there, there will be enough. There will be enough room. But the only room where there, there, where there may not be enough room is in the, is in the trading lounge. In the trading so, lounge. Yeah. And I did, the trading floor now. I did talk to Nicole, and we are going to be far enough away from the main room where we won't be interfering with the presentations. When we're screaming and yelling out trades and stuff. <laughs> That's about that. Joel's pretty loud. <laughs> All right. So remember back, you'd be screaming out. Remember back on the bright trading floor? You'd be yelling out the stuff. S and P's be yelling levels at us. As we're all trading small cap stocks, that didn't yeah. care half the time. We're all small cap traders back then. I lived on small caps back in 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001. I was living on small caps until like the tech bubble. And then it was Lucent Technologies. I just lived on Lucent Technologies. But anyways, we digress once again. Let's get to Merger Monday here. We're seven minutes in. Tell us all this news. I kind of, you know, I kind of stole your thunder there, Spencer, because I told all the news. But give us some details on these deals. All right. So the data or the Tableau Software Salesforce deal, that broke at like 7 a.m. on the nose here is when the, is when the PR came out. So um, Tableau is being acquired by Salesforce for $16.7 billion each share of a class A and B shares of Tableau will be exchanged for 1.103 shares of Salesforce. It's all stock deal. An all stock deal. So 1.103 is your ratio. Yep. Calculate the price between Tableau and Salesforce. That's your big one of today. We of course had the over the weekend uh, merger of equals between Raytheon. And this is a report from the journal, I believe Raytheon mm-hmm. and UTX. Uh, merging Raytheon shareholders will receive 2.3348 shares in the combined company uh, for each new share. So 2.3348 is your yep. ratio between Raytheon and UTX. And the third headline is that Shutterfly may get taken out here. Apollo Global Management is in the lead to acquire Shutterfly. That is a headline from Reuters. Wow. So a lot, of, a lot of M&A here. A lot of M&A. It is an official merger Monday here. So we got a big defense deal. We've got a big tech deal, cloud deal, if you want to call it. And then we have the Shutterfly news too. And then, you know, we've got the crazy IPOs, which are still flying. P- Pinterest, which I should have did. I talked about twice on the show and never did buy it. And it's been blasting off. It's up here again. Uh, but that's, you know, r- r- besides the point here. Let's jump over back to the deal that broke at 7 o'clock. That's the one that's really moving a lot of tech stocks and a lot of cloud stocks here this morning. And that is CRM acquiring data. Um, like I said, right away, I thought Twilio. And you, you're trying to think so quickly. And, and like I said, I'm tired. And you're trying to think quickly. And you see the merger and you're processing. Uh, you know, If that happens at like 9 a.m. when you got your wits all about you, I'm going to be a lot quicker. But anyways, if I go to the tape, it actually took me about 40 seconds before I bought Twilio. So, and I paid up a buck and a half. So I'm sure there were some people way ahead of me. I'm sure there were some bots way ahead of me that were paying it lower, but um, it was a good pickup. Um, but if we look at the other sympathy plays here, Splunk now, SPLK, up by box. You can go to service now, I think about NOW. It's up, it's only up two or, or no, it's up five bucks here too now. Um, you can go Viva Systems, V-E-E-V. 
That's trading up seven points here in the pre-market. The bigger guns aren't going to be up quite as much, remember, because they're bigger. But Workday is up $5 into it. You could think about it. It hasn't traded up at all. But again, who's, you know, they're not going to, it's the smaller ones that they're probably, you know, going to bid up quicker there. Um, v, yeah, we did Viva Systems. If there's any other ones that I'm missing here, um, think about it. But um, let's just jump back into the merger. We got a question from the chat there too. Why is it dropping from the highs, DATA? Well, it's got to follow CRM. And CRM is starting to come off. So CRM is now down, all stock deal is now down seven bucks. So, you know, you just do the quick ratio here and you go the 1.1 times CRM. I believe it's trading with a premium to the deal. Is it not right now? If that ratio, it's 1.103. Uh, yeah, it, yep. the, yeah, the ratio is 1.103. No cash component, all stock. Not that I'm seeing all stock. Okay, so one, so just go price of CRM. Let's just say 154, it's, and it's 153. So we'll go 154 for fun. Uh, times the 1.103, and that's going to give you a price of $169.86. Data right now is trading $169. So it's going to now just follow CRM. CRM goes down, data is going to go down. CRM comes back up, data is going to go up. Risk Arbs are going to put a discount. Right now, they're only putting about an 80 cent discount in there, which is pretty thin. Maybe they think there's a potential for another, you know, acquirer to come in. I don't know who's going to pay, you know, 34% premium on data. I don't know if there is another one, but the Risk Arbs are not throwing that possibly completely out, or they would give it more of a discount with the time value of money. And Dennis, you're like these sympathy plays and stuff. You're 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 buying them. You're buying them for a trade here. Right? Trade out. I'm already out of Twilio. All right. I just in and out. You know, everybody, you know, who was that that said I have the FIFO problem? It's totally true. First in, first out. I wasn't quite the first one in. I was too sleepy to be the first one in. But I was probably one of the first ones out. So I started selling Twilio on the 148 handle. I sold just sold the rest of it before the show started at 149. So I'm completely out okay. of my Twilio position now. Because a lot of times you do get these sympathy pops and you do get these moves. And then there's not a deal on the table. I mean, there's, there's you know, people are thinking the way you're thinking. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that you weren't buying. I'm not putting these in the long term portfolio yeah, exactly. because of this. Okay. These are uh, trades. I'm a headline trader and just to counter, you know, I know Josh Brown and we respect Josh Brown. Great guy. I respect his analysis. You know, he wrote a paper or he, he wrote his blog point and said that nobody can profitably trade headlines. He's wrong on that. He's wrong because I've done headline trading profitably for a decade. So there is definitely people who can trade headlines profitably. Do you got to be quick? Yes. Can you still beat the bots? Sure you can. So I basically, I would say, if I define my own trading, I do a lot of different stuff, statter of all kinds of fun stuff. But I would say headlines is a good chunk of my money that I make every year, trading the headlines. And do I, am I making the money on data? No, Josh Brown's like, data's taking off. The bots are all over it. You're probably, as a human being, not going to make the money. But you can definitely make the money on the sympathy ones because at Twilio, I bought 40 seconds after the deal was announced. And 40 seconds is a long time for me. Usually I can process something and do it in about seven to 10 seconds. But again, I was sleepy, so it took me a long time. A lot of the other market was sleepy there this morning too. So, you know, there was one of the things are still sitting there 40 seconds later. So don't kid yourself. You can make money trading headlines. Is it, is it just going to be a headline trade? Am I just a headline trader? No, there's other strategies. You got to have a whole bunch of strategies, but don't just write headlines off that nobody can make money trading headlines because it's not true. Uh, now, so we're getting to ask about AKAM, Akami. That's not really trading up. Does that really fit into this? Uh... I don't have it on my list. Yeah. Um, I know Akami Technologies, I trade it. I don't have it on, as a direct peer, but, and, and, and give us that site again, Spencer, the Benzinga site that's got all the peers, because that's a great resource. Give us yeah. that right now. Quotes.benzinga.com. Uh, hubs is, is it interesting. Hubs, you would think would could move with Salesforce, a deal like, like this. It hasn't yet this morning. Uh, let me see. But quotes.benzinga.com. So if we type in quotes and go general... to type in data, you can go down here. It's a great resource. You go to related companies. Spencer. You've got Cadence design, uh, got Twilio, Checkpoint. Wow, this one isn't doing the best job, but Twilio is on there. So <laughs> you got you to tweak this one. On It's difficult with the cloud. It's different. Zendesk is on there. There's a few. Ring Central. I didn't think of RNG. That one's on there. So it's got a few other ones in there too. Um, we're gonna have to do a little tweak on that algo. But there's definitely, you know, trade trade desk is trading up. But Ring Central is one I, I didn't think of. RNG. I would notice that right away too. Most of these though, I just have I trade the stocks so much I have them in my head. 
I have the main ones in my head. It, it's, you know, at seven o'clock in the morning when my brain, I'm functioning on three brain cells, I could still put Twilio together. So Twilio and Splunk and, you know, ServiceNow and you can get the main ones and then you got to do a little digging farther for the smaller ones, sympathy ones. Let's go over to the defense sector here. Uh, big one over the weekend. We mentioned the UTX Raytheon deal and the combined ticker is going to be RTX on the NICE. Well, they already got the ticker figured out. They already got the ticker figured out, RTX. Uh, there was a conference call later today to, or right now actually, I think, to talk about this. But uh, let's talk about implications of UTX and Raytheon. Uh, it's a big deal. It's not the kind of premium that, you know, we're seeing in obviously that data deal. This is more of a merger of equals. So if we just take it, it's UTX is obviously going to get, what, what is the ratio here? Oh, it's a little bit of a longer one here. Yeah, uh, give it to me. It's 2.3348. That doesn't make sense though. Wait. Raytheon, Two... Raytheon shareholders are going to receive 2.3348. Of the new company. Yes. Okay. And then it's going to form together. So we got to do some exotic stuff to think about. I'll have to go read the press release myself because you can't just go UTX price times 2.33 to get no. it like a simple process in the data because it's going to be at the new company. Anyways, we'll figure that out. But obviously not the kind of premiums that we were being paid in the other ones. Both stocks are trading a little bit higher on this. They like the synergies. UTX is up four bucks and Raytheon is up seven or $13 here. But it's not the kind of crazy premiums. But does this mean we're going to see more consolidation in the industry? Possibly. Lockheed Martin, which would be your acquirer, one of the biggest in the industry. So also NOC. I mean, they're probably going to be the acquirer in General Dynamics. Those are your big guns. They're all trading higher. General Dynamics is actually bit up three bucks here right now. Market's up. Uh, but, you know, you got to think, you know, what's smaller. Um, I own Harris in my long-term portfolio, HRS. I wonder if it doesn't catch a bit off this. I'm sticking with it, so don't worry about it. You know, I've had this in my portfolio since the financial crisis. I'm not selling it. Um, I have a smaller one, too, in Canada. It's called CAE. I don't know if it catches a bit off this, but it is a defense stock and is a smaller company. If anybody else has some smaller potential targets, if they think, if they think it's going to be more consolidation in the, in the defense industry, let us know. Those are two off the top of my head just because I own them in my portfolio. But again, this isn't getting the buzz. This isn't like a huge premium that you know we have from the Tableau deal. And uh, boy, RTN, it's hard to say the word was out last week because you had a really strong market. And, uh, you know, it, it just had a tremendous. That's just following the market. Yeah, just following the market. So follow the leader, you know, in this one and get your ratios correct. Uh, Lockheed Martin, the sympathies, that's already up 466. NOC's up 771. So uh, once again, if you're playing these, you know, follow the leader and, uh, you know, see how they treat. I think UTX being up 435, I know it's not a huge merger, but that's kind of bucking the trend of acquiring. It's not really, an, I guess, a true acquisition. If you want to look for resistance in uh, in UTX, is that's going to be the dominant stock. I do see a series of highs. It looks like right around one the 137 handle, I see a pair of highs. And also another high at 138.15. Did get over that in pre-market trading, but uh, let's call 137 and a half resistance in UTX. Might as well hit the last. Might as well hit the last one here. Shutterfly. Yeah, Shutterfly, which again I mentioned, uh, not confirmed, but report that they potentially could get taken out here. I don't even see a price. Oh, I do see a price. Uh, it could be close to two billion dollars excluding the debt that they have but uh if it got taken a two billion what would that yeah, price I, that let's go take a look so the market cap on shutterfly close we got to do some air math here joel so get ready um the, the close is worth 1.67 billion so it, and as much as two billion that's what they said down that great so that would be up about 15 percent. so it's up seven percent so that would be like a 55 or 56 dollar price Oh, that doesn't sound that great to be paying fifty two thirty five to me on a rumor, unless you think the price is going to be significantly higher than that. That sounds a little bit like uh, I don't think I want to own this one. It's two billion, excluding nine hundred million dollars in debt. Yeah, I don't. I I think it's a rumor right now, but I'm not paying up on this rumor, so I'm out. Not not trading it. I mean, we got a ton of Shutterfly books in our house. Lisa uses it quite a bit. I just, you know, it had its major run up over $90. 
technically came back, but I, I just, you know, I've always thought about competition for this company and, you know, they are what they are pretty much, a, you know, one. one My wife company. uses that. It's yeah, so does Lisa, but I yeah, just, they like, she likes the product. Oh, those books are nice. Instead yeah. Of the, and the way they do them for like a hundred bucks or something yeah. or 50 bucks. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's fairly cheap. Yeah, but uh, I mean the chart. I mean it's had a basically two for one stock split since the middle of uh, 2018. So I think the company just doesn't see a lot of a lot of upside for it, and uh, they're going to take a deal here. I wouldn't say it's depressed price, but it's certainly well off the all time high. All right, let's go to pot stocks. Tilray uh, getting a. Boost this morning, one of their larger uh, institutional investors is giving them a vote of confidence. They are extending their lockup period by two years. The name of the firm is Privateer Holdings. They uh, are they, – let's, let's see the headline here. Um, they The lockups to be ex ex extended for up to two years on 77% of Tilray's total shares outstanding. So this the more share they're not going to get more diluted here and or it's not actually they're not going to be able to no. sell their shares for they're, a they're not going to be able to sell 77% gotcha. of the company's total shares yeah for 2 years. I, I mean, mean it's good news at least short term here. It's squeezing a bet. I mean does this turn the Tilray story around? I don't think so. I think you know it's rally still to be sold. I think this thing gets near $50. I think it's a sell. Wait wait how do you how do you read that? I, I read it is is like they don't want to sell here. Like, no, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh yeah, they're making a big thing. Oh, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna wait two years. They're like, oh man, we want to wait till this thing gets at least back to sixty. You know, maybe could have sold it at three hundred. This doesn't look like a vote of confidence at all for me. This looks like I don't want to sell it in the hole and well, get a little news on this. That's no one's gonna, gonna make, allowed. No, no one's gonna make them sell. They, all they're saying is we're not allowing ourselves. We're not allowing. They don't want to. Because okay. it's because they know because everyone's been pressing it ahead of it, right? Knowing that they have the shares, they got the overhang, the stock's been getting pressed. So they think that they come out with this, then it's gonna give a relief to the stock. It is. It's trading up six dollars and forty four eighty. Does this change the fundamentals of the company? Does this change the valuation? It could be worse. You know, they're gonna be looking at this in two years and gonna say, Oh, I didn't sell at forty five, now I gotta sell at twenty five, you know, or twenty. Or maybe they're right. Maybe the company grows into itself and they sell it like 80 or 100. So I don't know. I mean, valuation's always been a major issue here. Yeah. Two years is a long time. A lot can happen. But, you know, everyone's like, you know, popping it up. Am I buying the stock up six bucks on the fact that someone's no. not going to sell? When I don't know the reason why they're not. I mean, they're saying, hey, yeah, we're going to wait. I don't like this price. Well, do you think if this thing was at 120? That they would be selling or 140 or 150 hell yeah they'd be selling right away just the fact that it's down at 40 bucks and if and if it wasn't for this news today it closed to under 40 bucks so that's just the way i'm looking at it. you can look at the news two ways that's the way i'm and looking remember at it. it's something to keep in mind just forever when you think of tilray you think about the fact that one firm owns 77 <laughs> percent yeah. of the shares just think about that just don't forget that indefinitely it, it, keep that on your radar for two years because that's going to be the case could you get their cost basis spent oh god yeah <laughs> it's going to remain thin it's going to be able to obviously continue to squeeze the shorts and that's what you're doing here this morning is you're squeezing the shorts a little bit more too because people who were banking that there was going to be some more shares coming out or is not going to be the case here if they're going to hold those tighter so um you're seeing the pop here could it get a 50 yeah i think that's where your major resistance point comes in it's possible but again trend is pre, pre is is definitely still down overall stock is story has been broken for a long time does this change those facts no i'd be a seller of the pop if i was long 47 and a half is your pre-market high this just under your may 22nd high of uh 4808 so i got you know i had a 50 I don't even know if you'll see 50 a day on this. Nice pop. You took this home long over the weekend. You got the good news. I think it's going to be sold into. I don't even know if you're going to get back up to that pre-market high of 47.50. Okay, this is a good segue into something I was talking with Joel and Jeremy Newsom about on the weekend here and on the pre-market show with Spencer is I kind of look at this beyond me and I think it's like it feels like it's pulling a Tilray and in the good ways that I don't think we've had the big pop in it yet. I think there's going to be an epic, epic squeeze here in the next day or two, if not today. I'm just looking at it. Now, I am I have a small, long position. I bought it right after the close on Friday because I was like just thinking about this tail ray possibilities. And I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, 
but this thing is was wild, wild, wild on Friday. And I'm not saying I'm a Beyond Meat bull. I think to, to put everything out on the table, I think when we look at this, you know, three months from now, I think it's under 100 bucks. It's like a hot potato, though. I think it could pop to 200 before that. So that's what I was saying to Jeremy Newsom on the weekend. So I have a very, very small, long position, speculative capital only. You know, don't put anything in this you can't afford to lose. But I was looking and I wish it would have opened flat. It's opening up 12 bucks because I was thinking about going and buying the 155 calls. They went off the board at like three and a half bucks. And I'm like, I think they're too slow again because I think there's that possibility that this thing could just have this rip your face off short squeeze here right now. The locate has locate was never easy, but it's become even more difficult the last two days. So I think you're squeezing. I think you could even have the possibility of some buy-ins on this. I think it's like could potentially pull a tail ray and have this crazy day where it goes up like 50, 60 bucks. And then, and I don't know if that's today or tomorrow, or, you know, but I just think it's the pot, not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying there's the possibility that that could happen. So if I was short this thing, I'd be very scared. I have a small speculative long position. I probably will sell that. Um, maybe, I mean, it's up $13 already. I bought this. Thing. It's you know, and when you're up 10% overnight, it's hard not to take the profits, but, I, I did sell a little bit in the pre-market before the show started, but I don't know. What are your thoughts here? Do I, is it, does this, my theory hold water that this could have like a little epic squeeze before this story eventually is over? I mean, anything is possible in this market. I mean, if Tilray went to 300. It uh, went from 100 to 300 in like a day. And then I don't think this up. is doing that. I, think, I don't think it's going to 300, but I don't, I think it's impossible it could go to two. What do you think, Spencer? I mean, the thing just went from 100 bucks to 150 basically in one day. Why can't it go to 150? To- I, I think that the only way this is a good trade is if you, A, you know why you're buying you get it. Get the hell out before it breaks. <laughs> and B, you know when your out is. Seriously. Like, this is. The- I don't know if I know when my out is. <laughs> <laughs> my out's going to be pretty soon. Yes. <laughs> I'm already up 10% on my, on, on my Friday night trade. It's hard. You know the scalper blood in me. You, so, you, I mean, no, no, that's my point. But you, like, my point is like you're going to sell like in an hour, which is probably fine. at the after the open. I'm probably right. going to sell. But I don't know. It's small. Water. It's such a small it's position. Water. It's like Why peanuts. Would you sell? I have peanuts in this. It's very small. Put, but, a, put a GTC in at 199. I'd love to get 200, <laughs> but I don't think that's going to happen. But, I don't know. I, I I just think if I was short this thing, it's like okay, take you know my my position so small it's meaningless. So, but let's just uh you know. I just want to get the chat's thoughts on this too. I mean, we just saw stocks go stock go from 100 to 150 in one day. I, it's above, you know, it's up another 13 a day here. This stock is right in. It's like feeling like upside capitulation mode. I think it's going to top out in the next day or two. I just think that top could be a lot higher than people think. My, Don't no, get stuck with it. My, my point is, there are so many people. Uh, new new traders, new retail traders who don't have a lot of experience uh, trading. Who th- this is like th- this is the Bitcoin of now, right? And and, and it's hot and it's hot and they want in, and they're not gonna and they don't really know why. They just know what's hot. They want to make a quick buck and they don't know when their out is. And as long as you know when your out is and you know why you're buying it, it's a good trade. Even if you lose money, you know that's an okay trade. If if you know why and you know when your out is, that's an okay trade. If, if even if you lose money, if you don't know the answer to those questions, then that's a that's a horrible trade. I'll just tell you the theory. Don't, don't of, just uh, buy it and put it in your investment portfolio. That's what I would, you know, say is I I, I think long term. And sorry to cut you off, Joel. That's okay. I, I just want to be careful with what I'm you know saying here too. Is like this. I think if you're in at this point, you gotta do it exactly what Spencer's saying. Have an out. Don't just stick this and say, oh, I think this is gonna be a five hundred dollar stock in a year or two, because I don't think this valuation holds up. I think it ends badly. And I think it does pull, I think it like does the till Ray whole thing has this blow off top where the shorts get squeezed out and everybody's out and then just, you know, slowly continues to leak. And we saw till Ray, you know, it had, it went to the 300 and then it had some chances if you look back at the till Ray chart, but eventually it just leaked, 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 leaked. And, you know, people who were buying that thing at 140 or 150 after the blow off top, we know are down significantly. So once this has the blow off top, it's it. So these things usually end in some, I call it upside capitulation. Some people were thinking that was Friday. I don't think it was because now it's making new highs in the pre-market. I didn't think it was Friday night when I bought the stock. So I think there's going to be upside capitulation the next day or two. I think it could be a lot higher than people think. 
I just going to say the uh, the thing that Spencer gave the theory about it's a called stock. They're, you know, these people are in it. They're going to buy the top. I heard the same thing when that thing was at 75 bucks, 80 bucks when uh, when uh, Andrew left put his short on and said, oh, is he still short? Uh, you never hear when he covers these things. Yeah, you never hear. He said yeah. he was 65. I don't know if it went to after that. Um, all I know is I remember I was shorted the day that he was on and it went down like eight bucks. And I'm like, ha, ah, this is good. And another thing like rallied like six bucks. And I'm like, this ain't right. You know, this is not acting like a normal left stock. So I ended, I don't know. I think what saved me and that is I was going out of town on a Friday and the options were expiring on that Friday. So on that Thursday, I was just like, I'm going to get the hell out of them. And I did. And then man, oh man, it just took straight up, went straight up. But you know, that we'll just see. I mean, maybe wait for, I don't even know if you can't even really apply any good tacticals to this. No, no technicals. Yeah. Really. Yep. The only thing I could see is the Tilray chart. And the only reason I thought about it was because Tilray on that first day, can we go back, Spencer, and show the chart from Tilray when it first broke over 100? Yes. And it's a thin float, so it has like similar characteristics. The thin float, the hard borrow, the you know valuation that makes no sense whatsoever. It has these similar characteristics. And that second day, was it all one day? It went from like 100 to 300? It went from 150 to 300 back to 150 in one day. And all one day. I I don't think it's going to be that crazy because I don't know if it's that thin. But could it do like a 150 to 200 back to 150 in one day? Maybe. I I wish it would open flax. I was going to buy some calls. And now going to open up. Like I was looking at those 155s. And thinking, I even talked to Jeremy. I was talking to Joel about it. I was like, this thing can open you only up a couple bucks or something. And, you know, those 155s are sitting there for three or four bucks. I'm going to buy some just for, you know, speculation. Now those 155s are at the money. So now those 155s are going to trade for like 12 bucks. Now you got to go like, I don't even know what options are out there, you know, listed. If they've even even higher than that. The thing is at 154, 20, it keeps climbing. We started talking about it three points ago. It's still climbing. So I don't know. This thing, it's a layer. That's the problem. And if you're short this thing, scary to be short these things. Well, you just got to figure it out. You know, it's a call. Pull that stock, till, right? It's a call stock, right? And so, you know, the pot stocks were, were called stocks and they had their run. But what, you know, what is the entire audience of, you know, potheads that are vegans? So you, I mean, this thing could really, you know, it's has uncapped potential here. Right. If it's a double called stock. So I don't know. We'll have to find. Well, this way, we'll just have to wait for some kind of. Technical- what do you th- what do you th- like? I don't know what options will come listed. I think the 155. What, well, you got to go out further if you go out, you know, for the next week. I was looking at this week. I think 155 was the biggest option they had as of Friday. We're going to list more. But All right, before I, we do the imbalance, the market makers are getting rocked on this, though. Like if anybody. Well, anybody. I shouldn't say the market. You know, the market makers hedge themselves. But anybody who's just flat out been selling you know, naked calls on this thinking oh. like those one Oh fives we talked about on the show before the earnings, they were five bucks or four bucks. That was silliness. Yeah, I know I did. did I, and I, and I wanted to buy it. And I looked down, I was going to buy those one Oh five calls. I was buying the weekly. So I wouldn't have been participating in this move, but Holy cow, that would have been a 10 bagger. So I know maybe somebody did. We talked about it on the show on the Thursday and I didn't make a trade off of it. I thought about it, but I didn't have the locate on the stock. That was probably a good tell. When you don't have the locate on the stock means nobody's going to be able to, short the dang thing and it's going to have these ridiculous moves when you can't get the locates these things happen too so anyways crazy moves this thing's already up 15 bucks here this morning again so i think the blow off top is going to happen in the next day or two it's just a matter of how high it's going to go uh real quick uh question here on waste management double m well WM hard to say anything about it made a new all time high yesterday. So the numbers I'm looking at, you want to see it get above that 11542. Uh, and if you don't want to pay attention to that high, just see if it, how many more all time closing highs it can post here. So my main number in that one is 11436. It's trading red in the session. We'll see who wants out at the mark. Uh, Amazon big day on yesterday, getting filed through today. Don't see much on the dailies. I see like three highs. It's called 1845, 1850 is your next resistance in Amazon, potential resistance. And there was another stock I wrote down. What? Uh, well, we got Whitney Tilson coming up. We'll, uh, we'll cover yeah. that. 
Yep. All right. So let me bring on today's guest, Whitney Tilson, uh, longtime hedge fund manager, uh, well known throughout the space. Empire Financial Research is his firm uh, right now. And uh, Whitney, are you with us? Good morning. Yeah, I am. Uh, how are you? Doing well. How about yourself? Great. Uh, any, we're just talking about Beyond Meat here. Any advice for anybody who's looking to trade Beyond Meat right now or buy Beyond Meat or short Beyond Meat? Any Beyond Meat advice? Um, you're asking me. Um, my general, uh, I ha I'm not super familiar with the company. I think it's an exciting new growth area. And like many exciting new growth areas, um, uh, you know, there are some hot IPOs. And uh, my general, I, I have never bought an IPO in my life. Uh, I think we are in an IPO bubble. Um, the, not quite early in my career, the 1999 bubble. Um, things aren't as crazy then, but I read somewhere that about 90% of the recent IPOs are money losing companies. And that's a pretty good barometer for how overheated the IPO market is and how badly investors are likely to get incinerated. And 90% is uh, pretty much uh, very close to the all time historical high back in 1999. So my general advice to most people is, is um, you're the you're the last sucker at the poker table coming into the any of these recent IPOs now. So avoid it like the plague and uh, go look for uh, established companies that actually have profitability, heaven forbid. Could it uh, a similar statement been made about some of these uh, tech IPOs at that time, too? I mean, Amazon, Google losing money companies. I mean, you know, it's a valid argument, but, you know, what's different in this scenario? Yeah, well, actually, Google was profitable, uh, uh, I believe, when it went public. Um, it was trading at a very high multiple, and it's easy to cherry pick some of the spectacular, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies uh, over time um, and say, wow, you would have done well if you bought their IPOs. And that's absolutely true. But but what's important is, is uh, what I call that the tyranny of the anecdote. Um, um, you need to look at the entire marketplace and look at absolute debacles. Uh, uh, like GoPro and Blue Apron, and, and those were super hot and soared, uh, and, and then investors got incinerated. Uh, mathematically speaking, um, they've done studies of all IPOs over decades, and it's the single worst place to invest. Um, you, there is no sure way to lose money uh, in any strategy than buying hot IPOs. Uh, Whitney, I want to talk to you about changing your mind. We talk a lot about short-term trading on this show and changing your mind on a, on a dime. You changed your mind recently in a name, LL, that you were famously short. You helped expose fraud on the company. And then a few months ago, you said, nope, this is a long for me now. So, you know, I, I care less about the LL specific news as I care about your thought process as to how did you go about changing your mind? What went into that decision? A stock that you've been short for years, it was a good winner for you and you flip to the long side. Yeah, look, it's very, very important. And I'm glad you asked it because it's a great case study of one of the most important things you must be able to do as an investor, which is keep an open mind um, and be willing to accept disconfirming information and be willing to uh, either admit you were wrong or simply say, this story has played out. It's time to take my profits, whether a stock is ripped up on the long side uh, that you're long um, or that you made a lot of money on the downside. And by the way, this uh, it's even more important if you're getting killed on a stock and a stock you went in on the long side and it's gone down and recognizing that you've made a mistake and got stuck in a value trap, for example. Um, it's uh, in the case of lumber liquidators, it, I guess it sort of helped that there was a multi-year period in between when I was short and when I was long it. That always helps clear your mind to be out of a position for a while. And that can be an important first step if you're, if you're not sure about something, you know, get out, clear your mind, at least for 30 days. Uh, so, you, um, you, you know, for tax reasons often. So in the case of lumber liquidators, uh, I got in uh, at 100 bucks a share. The stock was trading at 50 times earnings, had an uh, inexplicable uh, doubling of its operating profit margin. And, um, and something didn't add up. I didn't know the formaldehyde story at the time. And it really just played out beautifully over the course of two or three years. I ended up bringing the, uh, discovering the formaldehyde story, bringing it 60 minutes. You know, the stock later went down by about 90%. Um, then I correctly got out. The stock then went from 10 bucks to about 40 bucks. Um, and I saved, saved my bacon getting out by not sticking around too long on the short side. 
And now today, it's back to about 10 bucks. It's trading close to a 21-year low. It's trading at its IPO price, you know, 20 odd years ago. Um, yet uh, the company has finally settled uh, with the regulators, with all the class action attorneys. Um, you know, a million dollars a month of legal expenses is uh, has has now basically come to a stop. The company should be able to reinvest in its business, and I think it's a long now. All right, but how how do you know when to sell in the first place? Yeah, well, interestingly, I kept an open mind. Um, about nine months after the 60 Minutes story aired, I got a call from a senior executive, one of the guys I had driven out. I'd cost him his job. And he sent me an email saying, hey, Whitney, could you take down the nasty articles you wrote about me back you know, eight months ago? It's hurting my ability to get a job, uh, to find employment again. Um, and so uh, rather than just ignoring it, I thought he was an evil guy. And I had written that he was one of the people who been was behind the scheme to poison Lumber Liquidator's own customers. But I said, you know what? I'd like to hear what the guy has to say. So I picked up the phone and called him. We had an hour long conversation. He introduced me to another executive. And basically they made the case to me two things. Number one, yeah, we made a mistake in our sourcing and our Chinese suppliers gave us bad product, but we didn't deliberately intend to poison our customers, which is what I had thought they had done. And number two is, as they said, Whitney, this is a better business than you give it credit for. And Lumber Liquidators has one of the best four wall unit economic models in retail, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm long the stock now, but they helped open my eyes to the fact that this wasn't some crummy business and, it, and they were therefore likely to survive all the investigations and lawsuits and so forth, in which case I didn't want to be shorted. So the key was I kept an open mind and I was willing to listen to what my worst enemies had to say. Um, and they actually opened my eyes to some things my mind had been closed to and some things, just some facts that I didn't know. And that's what, why I decided to cover and get out and move on. All right, let's move on to some other stocks. You're, you're bullish on Amazon and Google and Facebook right now. Yeah. All, all three uh, have uh, varying degrees of major headwinds at the moment, uh, political, regulatory headwinds, at least potential headwinds, uh, and some, some negative, a lot of negative press uh, around the big tech sphere at the moment. So uh, explain, how, how much of that is a concern to you? Yeah, um, look, it's something I'm monitoring very closely, and I think it's very important to distinguish between business headwinds and uh, headline headwinds. And, and, and the, the headlines are real about uh, government uh, investigations and uh, regulatory scrutiny, which by the way, I think is healthy for these companies. I think frankly, speaking as a citizen, not as an investor, I think this is super healthy for our society um, in the way that uh, these companies have accumulated so much power. And in the case of Facebook in particular, have been used to foment genocide in places like Myanmar and Sri Lanka. Um, and manipulate elections around the world. So all this is healthy. The question though is, is, is the businesses, I, I'm an investor and ultimately over a multi-year time period, which is always the time period I'm looking at, um, uh, I have no opinion on these stocks as a short-term trade. Um, uh, over a multi-year time period, I believe these stocks will follow their earnings trajectory and the businesses are actually booming. Um, the growth rates, the profit margins, the explosion in profitability at Amazon, for example. Amazon is becoming a, not just a revenue growth story, it is turning into a, a real free cash flow story over the next couple of years. Uh, so, and the other two companies, uh, Alphabet and, and Facebook are just gushing cash and have enormous margins already. Um, so I think uh, the fundamentals here are, there's, there are incredible tailwinds, not headwinds, in terms of the fundamentals of the business. And that's ultimately over, let's say, a three to five year time horizon, what will drive the stocks. But so how does this DOJ FTC stuff play out in your, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. My guess is, I mean, look, the, you know, I look back to Microsoft um, and everyone points to that as, oh, that, you know, look, that's a stock you wanted to avoid you know, when the, uh, when the investigation started. In fact, if you go back to 1992, when the investigation started, all the way through for the next eight years of constant regulatory scrutiny, Microsoft stock was up 25 times during that eight year period. Now granted into the peak of the internet bubble, but in other words, the stock followed the, the business fundamentals, not the headlines uh, for eight years after the investigation started. 
you know, my guess is, is uh, that these companies will not be broken up, barring a President Elizabeth Warren and Democrats controlling the Senate, uh, which I think is very unlikely. Uh, so uh, barring that, uh, I think there will be fines. I think there will be significant scrutiny. Um, and that might uh, you know, reduce the growth rate from 25% to 20% or something. But in other words, the, there's still going to be incredible growth. Uh, these are still going to be dominant companies. And I would point to the embedded options in these companies, which haven't even really started to be monetized yet. In the case of Google, they've got Alphabet, Waymo, um, uh, and Android, all three um, enormously valuable franchises that they're barely beginning uh, to tap the profitability. Over at Facebook, you've got Instagram and WhatsApp that they're just starting to monetize. Uh, I'm much more excited about the, monetizing those embedded options than I am concerned about the regulatory scrutiny. So you're banking on the fundamentals and a correspondingly rational stock move. Yes. So that leads us to Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following uh, Bitcoin at all? Any of the fundamentals or technicals? Do you have a, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I don't follow any technicals on anything. Um, the problem with Bitcoin is, is what fundamentals? Um, uh, you know, I've, um, you know, it, I put Bitcoin in a separate category. I know you guys were talking about Tilray um, and some of the pot stocks and so forth. Um, um, and I would put those two in very different categories. The marijuana sector is is legalization is a trend that is coming around the world. There's going to be increased demand. There are actual companies with actual revenues. Now they may be trading at ridiculous multiples of those revenues. The valuation may not make sense, but these this is a sector that it is possible to do fundamental research. In fact, I've done quite a bit of research on the sector um, and I'm hoping that there's a, a gigantic bust in the sector, just like there was in the internet sector where you could have gotten in and bought booking.com at a dollar. You could have bought Amazon at eight bucks. You could have bought Apple at a buck, right? After the bust in those sectors. You, so it's do the work uh, in the cannabis sector, but wait for the bust because a bust will be coming. I mean, I nailed Tilray stock. I noticed you guys were talking that day. It was September 17th the last year when Tilray went from 150 to 300 back to 150 in a day. I was actually on live national uh, web stream on Yahoo Finance TV the very minute that it hit 300. And I said, this stock will go down by 90% to 30 bucks. I put a price target on it within 12 months. And here we are at 38 bucks. Uh, and we're not even halfway through the year that I predicted. So, you know, sometimes big obvious bubbles come along. In the case of Bitcoin, I sent out an email to 7,000 of my subscribers um, on December 16, 2017, the very hour Bitcoin peaked at $20,000. And I said, I'm calling the top. This is, this is madness. And it was because my Navy SEAL buddies were coming home from deployment and taking their hardship pay and buying a, a Bitcoin with it. That was the sign of the top, right? So, uh, so Bitcoin, you just have to understand, is a pure speculative instrument. There is no intrinsic value or fundamental value. My personal view uh, echoes Warren Buffett that it is rat poison squared. Um, if you're looking for speculation, go look in the cannabis sector um, uh, rather than Bitcoin and cryptos, because at least in the cannabis sector, there actually are some real companies doing some real things, and there's going to be real growth in, or in revenues and someday cash flows there. What right. about which, which stocks in the cannabis sector? Because there's so many. Um, you know, we know you, you weren't a fan of Tilray. Is there any one that you think is getting to a point or the, the bust hasn't come yet to make you interested? You know, I, 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 the, the valuations are still so high um, that I haven't really found anything to uh, dig, dig my teeth into yet. Um, there's a private company called Northern Swan that wouldn't surprise me if it goes public in the next year. That is, I think, the leader in um, uh, growing down in Colombia, um, and uh, um, and they have something like right now. There, there's a huge inefficiency in the market, which is, for example, Canada says, you know, all the legal marijuana sold in Canada has to be grown in Canada. Well, Canada is the absolute worst place you can imagine, you know, with its frozen tundra. Um, so the cannabis producers there have to build super expensive warehouses and their cost is two bucks a gram. And meanwhile, Columbia has the perfect growing environment and Northern Swan is growing down there at 20 cents a gram, right? So they have a 90% cost advantage. Now, right now, 
the, the Canadian market is closed and each state in the United States is requiring that production be done locally. But uh, that that's, doesn't make any sense. And someday in the same way that Colombia has 70% of the world's cut flowers, like when you buy roses for your sweetheart on Valentine's Day, 70% of, of the world market in those flowers is coming from Colombia. And so it has the infrastructure, it has the climate, uh, et cetera. So I, I would be long uh, Colombia as a as a marijuana producer in the same for the same reasons it's been successful in flowers, um, but again there's so many scammy companies uh, running around out there uh, overpaying for assets etc. So it's really important to do your work and and find the legitimate ones. And I was very impressed uh, with uh, with what I saw at Northern Swan and its uh, CEO Kyle Detweiler. Uh, one more for you, Whitney. Tomorrow's Tesla's annual shareholder meeting. I'm sure we'll get some headlines out of that. Uh, I know you're bearish to stock. Do you have a price target or any any predictions for how this story shakes out here? What do you do with Tesla? Yeah, um, I've um, you know Tesla was my worst short ever. I got caught in um, Tesla doing very well back in 2013 when they launched the Model S. And then it turned into just a gigantic bubble. And I was foolish enough to be short it, you know, up from 35 to 205 or whatever. Uh, eventually, I did some more research uh, and got out, uh, took, took my lumps. Uh, but uh, I warned all my short selling friends, stay out of Tesla. It's an open-ended situation. It's a brilliant, uh, Elon Musk is a brilliant engineer, entrepreneur, visionary. He's attracted a lot of really talented people. They all work 20 hours a day. You just don't want to be short that. Uh, I pivoted uh, on March 5th. Uh, I sent around an email to my 35,000 subscribers and saying, this is, this is the time that, to get short Tesla. It was at 295 uh, on its way down. And it's when it became clear that they were gonna blow uh, Q1 uh, earnings uh, and sales. Um, and, uh, I can, and so I put a $100 price target on it by the end of the year. It's about halfway there. Um, and, um, and I still have that price target on it, uh, despite the capital raise, which gives them some more breathing room. Um, the problem with Tesla is it's burning large amounts of capital. Um, and the demand, it, it used to be, it wasn't clear that they could produce the cars. Now it's not clear that they can sell all the cars. Now, I actually think they will sell the cars they produce, but they'll just have to cut prices massively. I mean, obviously, if they sold cars for a dollar, they could sell every car, right? So um, I think that the, there's been some bullishness in the stock in the past couple of weeks because the sales numbers are actually picking up. They're still going to blow their guidance of 90 to 100,000 cars. My best estimate is a little over 80,000. So it's still going to be a big miss in Q2. We're almost finished with Q2 in the next couple of weeks, by the way. So the numbers are pretty up to date. The, the problem is, is, is I think they've had to cut prices a lot in order to move the cars that they're producing. And so it's going to be another uh, terrible quarter uh, burning through in terms of profitability. They're going to burn through an awful lot of cash. And I, I'm, I'm looking at sort of a distress financing later this year. I don't think the stock goes to zero because there are people like Larry Ellison and others who just believe in the story. So they'll probably raise the capital and avoid uh, bankruptcy and a zero on the stock. That's why I put a hundred dollar price target on it, not zero. All right. Whitney Tilson will be the keynote speaker at the Benzinga Trading Summit. So if you need another reason, yet another reason to attend the event, here is it. Whitney, can you give us a quick preview of what you're going to discuss? Do you know yet? You know, um, uh, I've, I've been playing phone tag with one of your producers to sort of narrow it down. Um, but you can probably expect uh, some of the same commentary I've just given you here. I know your Benzinga audience is, is you know, likes, uh, uh, you know, things that are moving, like the cannabis sector, like the cryptocurrency spec uh, sector, uh, like Tesla stock. And, uh, you know, so I'll probably, I, I'm, I'm accustomed to being the skunk at the garden party uh, with my, uh, you know, with my uh, skeptical views. And, and, you know, I think uh, I, I respect Benzinga for inviting someone like me to come speak and to come, you know, warn, warn people about the dangerous speculation. You know, I, I started investing in the late 90s at the tail end of a 17 year bull market. And uh, I could have uh, I, I got value investing religion in the nick of time because people like Warren Buffett and Seth Klarman and Joel Greenblatt and people, they taught me. And, and gave me some words of advice. And so I'll, I, I intend to pay it forward to your audience. All right, Whitney Tilson, uh, Empire Financial Research is the name of his firm right now. Like I mentioned, he'll be at the Benzinga Trading Summit June 20th. Whitney, uh, thanks so much for the time today and uh, we'll see you there. My pleasure. All right.
All right, Joel, 8.54 here. Uh, where are we at? Uh, well, we had we had Trump on TV, right? Did we I, did, yeah. yeah He's still yeah. there. He's still yeah. talking, isn't he? He's still talking. Woo. He talks. Yeah. Um, he was supposed to come on our show next, wasn't he? Did you confirm? I don't mind up. Is he the next guest? Well, confirmed with with uh, Miss Sanders, but well, I tried to. She didn't get back to me, so. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he'd want to come on our show. Uh, we're just we're just hanging on to these gains. We're up thirteen and a half handles here at uh, twenty eight eighty eight fifty. Um, just a number that it's just coming out to me derived from the market is uh, mid range on the session. So that's going to be your key for me. Uh, mid range comes in at uh, 89 and a quarter, 28, 89 and a quarter on that last bump. We got to 91 and a quarter. So this call 28, 90 key to more upside coming back on the downside. Not much until you get to that pre-market low of 80, 50. Uh, did we? Did we miss? Let's just let's just talk those S and P's for a second, though. Oh. This was an incredible rally yes, or last week. I mean, put it in perspective. We rallied five percent here in a week. If you're coming in here and buying stocks now, so so late to the party. Like I was saying, I bought a couple things in my long term portfolio. I went that one day, uh, just kind of diving in and seeing what you know. And I bought some Square. I bought some BOT Zebra. I bought some emerging market ETFs just because I thought it was getting overdone. I put that in the long term retirement account. Trading wise, obviously, you know, you're always buying and selling, but you know, we just had Whitney Tilson on. It was just, I was an excellent piece. Thanks for getting him on. And it, and it's so good because we are a trading show and we talk short term trading a lot. And, you know, and I was just talking about beyond me, you know, and this thing is crazy here right now. And, and we like to trade and we, we like to do a little bit of speculation, but you have to be careful because when you're doing speculation, you know, it's a completely different story. These kind of stocks are not meant for your long term investment portfolio. These types of stocks are meant, you know, if you want to trade, you're trading with money you can afford to lose. Like I said with Beyond Meat, I have a small, small speculative long, and it's speculative capital money that I can afford to lose. If this stock went to zero, I'm going to be okay. So never put anything in any of these stocks that, you know, are crazy like this that you can't afford to lose. You know, but that with that being said, you know, it's important to, you know, put, you know, investing here, investing hat on here now too. Do I want to be buying the S&P in my long-term portfolio after just rallied 5% last week? No, you're doing it backwards. I mean, if you were nervous and maybe you were over, you know, weight, maybe you were long too much, it's giving you another chance to, you know, get out of some stocks then. So because we are right back up here, we're 2 3% off the highs now after getting, you know, the majority of, of May's losses back. So it's giving you a chance to lighten up. And I think if you're buying stocks now, I think you're late to the party, at least, you know, and, and long term, you're always, you know, if you're doing dollar cost averaging and doing everything, you know, that, that, that works. But, you know, trying to time the market's always tricky from a long term investing standpoint. That's why when we get significant pullbacks, that's usually when I nibble on my long term portfolio. And obviously, like a stock like Square, I was able to buy last week at 63. It's 69 here this morning. So, I mean, you know, buying when everybody else is selling is the Warren Buffett approach. And I think that's a better way, at least from an investing standpoint. And as you were pretty funny last week when we were speaking on the phone and uh, it was maybe it was before last week and the market was going down. You're like, I'm getting I'm doing great trading, but my portfolio is getting killed and killed. Long term investment portfolio is getting rocked. And I said, well, lighten up. And you go, but I'm under invested. (laughs) I'm not lightening up. But I added. I added stocks to my long-term done. portfolio. No, I mean, and that, I'm still underinvested from December. It shows you don't, you know, if you got a time horizon better than 20 years, I, I would say, you know, we don't give investment advice in the show. We can't do Not it. But, you know, from my own personal standpoint is I feel like I'm, I'm 43 years old now. I probably have a good, you know, trading's a hard job. So maybe it's, you know, you got 15 years left of trading. If you, you know, I've been doing it 20 you think 35 and out. So maybe I'm only going to trade another 10 or 15 years. My eyes, you know, with the glaucoma thing I got going on now, you don't know. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, it's still looking at long-term investments. I never would go to 100% cash because if the market turns around like it did on a dime last week, you're left standing there with nothing. I mean, there's always a risk with being, the, the, the riskiest position, in my opinion, is to be in 100% cash. And people don't think that, but it is because if the markets go from Dow 10,000 to Dow 100,000 over the next 15 years, you're not being inflation or anything with those cash components. You're, you're, you're out. You're, you, you, the market, you know, everybody else's wealth, because if they were dollar cost averaging or investing in funds, is up, you know, tenfold, and you're sitting there up nothing. So everybody else got wealthier. 
And, you know, obviously inflation is still a case. I know they say we don't have inflation, but it's not true. We know that there's still inflationary pressures. I mean, houses have went up ridiculous amount in Canada. They've went up everywhere else. You know, so you, you've got to, you know, at least have some investments for the long term, in my opinion. So as long as you can, like I, I say, you know, and I say this to my friends too, I was like, first thing, you know, what you do is you know, I always say is, you know, you try to pay off your, your, your house as quickly as you can. So, you know, if you, if you got a five and with interest rates lower, it's a different story, but if you got a five, 6% mortgage rate, you know, you, it's hard and the U S is deductible in Canada. It's not, so it's a different story too, but I just think long-term, I think you want to stay invested for the long haul. I do believe in the Warren Buffett approach. We could call it the Whitney Tilson approach here too value investing, looking at, you know, different companies, looking at valuations, not throwing all your money in beyond me thinking it's going to be a thousand dollars a share. and I'm going to retire on this because in all likelihood, it probably ends badly. This is one of those speculative bubbles here. Again, do I think the bubble can burst bigger here today in the, in, in the next couple of days? I do. That's why I'm, I'm in this for speculation, but I'll be quick to get out too. This bubble looks like it starts to burst. If this thing goes like 160, 170, then all of a sudden it's back down at 150. I probably want no part of it. That's market timing. That's a different animal. Long-term investing, stick, you know, for the long haul, buy good companies with reasonable valuations, and you should be okay. Uh, just real quick, Kraft Heinz on the move here, up a buck 34, oh. 3.08. I, uh, I think they filed their 10K on Friday. You want to I... know something? I was the first, I have the FIFO problem here too. I remember this trade Friday night. I was the first person. I actually was the first person that bought this Friday night. I bought it 2880 at 2885, I think in 2888. And I think all the trades on the tape are me. So if you go back and look at the 2880, 2885, all the first trades after that news headline, but because the CEO was set to, what was it, 20 million or something? He was committing to buy two of the stock. Vote of confidence that it needed. I said to my buddy, I was like, this is going to be over $30. And here I am selling it on the same Friday night at 2830 and 2840. Uh, first out or 2940 sorry so i made a quick 50 or 60 cents on the pop that's the day trader i mean the short-term trader but i should have held on to a little bit of it um because that's the vote of confidence it needed it's back up over 30 i think the stock is showing at least a little bit of life here now well they announced a new ceo and yes the ceo said as a vote of confidence he, here's here's 20 million dollars as soon as i saw the 20 million headline i bought the stock and on late friday night you have time again you can be a headline trader if you're quick so, I, I mean, you can go back and look at the tape. I don't know if I can grab it from Friday night, but I was able to buy stock. I think, I'm trying to go from my memory, like six cents up, like 28.80 and then 28.85, like whatever was there. I'm just lifting offers. There's not much there on a Friday night, but you're grabbing it. And it quick, and, it, and a few minutes later, it was trading up at 29.40. So it pops, you know, after a few minutes. But, you know, now it's up over $30. I should have held on to it. I knew when I was selling it. The FIFO problem, again, thank you for whoever was that pointed that out to me. I definitely have, this, I'm, I'm quick to get in, but way too quick to get out. Uh, 3023 stands as your pre-market high. And you want to get through that. And it's a big red candle that you got to fight through on that day. So the day that uh, you were in this range. So 3112 on this news, I don't think so. Uh, that was the high from May 28th. We'll see what happens. Uh, this will be an interesting one to see how many people pile in at the open, maybe take it like to 3040. And then if you come back down through that opening price, I don't think I'd want to be in it. Stocks had a nice move up since 27. So, oh yeah, 26, 96. Oh, you're short there. Intermediate term investors looking at this pop. And I think they will be, you know, looking for an exit. If it doesn't hold on to its gains, AMD, we didn't get to the AMD news, but man, this stock is just getting all kinds of love. 33.78, a buck 37, one number, one number only for AMD. And that was your September high at 34.14, which uh, we're wrapping approaching so we went a few minutes over today so okay we had a lot to get to so it's sure still okay to go you, for especially for monday exactly right a monday uh in june without earnings so a lot, a lot of news <laughs> today uh if you missed any part of today's show catch our podcast itunes soundcloud stitcher tune in google Podcasts, or just rewatch the show on youtube thanks to today's guest whitney tilson thanks to everybody in our chat please remember that all the information from our show is for informational purposes only not meant to be investing advice the benzinga trading summit is like a week away now 10 days away june 20th in new york city bzprofit.com promo code pmp50 all caps pmp as in pre-market prep 
to get half off your ticket to see people like Whitney Tilson at the event. Uh, that's our show for today. Everyone have a good rest of your day, and we will see you on Tuesday.